Hello, and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers, and lovers of literature everywhere. Today, we're listening to a selection of short stories written at a creative writing group in Tower Hamlet's Cemetery Park. They're inspired by some of the gravestones of people buried there, including Charlie Brown, a publican, the Woods family, who died of Spanish flu, leaving only one survivor, their young son, George. Alec Hurley, boxer and music hall star, and husband to the well-known singer Mary Lloyd, and Morris O'Connor, a workhouse doctor who committed suicide shortly after giving evidence in a trial. Shake and Shiver by Tabitha Potts Mum had had enough of the five of us, she said. Go and get your dad out of the pub now, or I swear I'll murder the lot of you. My big brother had moved out, so she asked me to go instead. I walked down West India Dock Road, all excited, because I had never been inside Charlie Brown's before, and it was the best place to visit if you dreamed of the sea. There were a lot of sailors from all over the world who came to the pub, and they all knew Charlie Brown. My dad was a stevedore, worked on the docks, queued up early in the morning, and on days when he didn't get any work, he'd be in there with his mates, like as not. The Dockers came from all over. Not my dad, though. We were born and bred on the Isle of Dogs. The Dockers were tough men, with strong arms from lifting cargo and stowing it with their hooks all day long. I admired them, but I worshipped the sailors. The sailors were adventurers. They came on shore from giant ships full of spices, silk, rum and fruit which moored in the docks. They came from all over the world, like the men we called Lascars who came from India. I loved sailors' songs and the stories they told, the way they made women laugh, and the way their eyes would go distant when you asked them about their travels. The pub was tall and narrow, built out of red brick with a copper dome on top and sitting on the corner of the street. It was called the Railway Tavern, but everyone knew it as Charlie's. He'd run it for nearly 40 years now. I ducked my head as I walked under the cages of three canaries outside the pub, which were singing away, not put off by the fact that it was getting dark on a foggy evening in winter. Inside the pub, it was warm and snug. A huge African grey parrot sat behind the bar, the first I'd ever seen. Hello, I said to it. Fuck off, it replied, and everyone in the pub laughed. The fair-haired barmaid smiled at my embarrassment as she pulled a pint of beer. My dad was sitting in the saloon with a whole gang of dockers and their girls, drinking Guinness and talking about the union. Most of it went over my head and so I stared around the pub instead. There was plenty to look at. There was a stuffed crocodile hanging from the ceiling, an albatross whose wings stretched wider than my arms, bows and arrows and a garland of shark's teeth. Above the bar door was a long pipe, with an ivory horse and a portrait of the Kaiser on its stem. The walls and ceiling were so covered in trophies of all kinds that you could hardly see the nicotine yellow paintwork beneath. Here's Charlie, came the whisper round the room, and I watched as he paid his evening visit to the saloon. He looked the business, wearing a well-cut suit and waistcoat. He had bright brown eyes and a smile which invited trust, in spite of his broken nose and a missing tooth he'd had replaced with gold. I watched as customers rushed forward to shake his hand and say hello. He was still a big man, and the rumour went that he had some hammers hidden in the cellar to keep any badly behaved customers in line. One sailor went up to him. He was tall with blonde hair cropped close to his skull and two swallow tattoos on his arms that I knew meant he'd sailed over 10,000 miles. Got you something I picked up, he said, and handed over a bizarre object. It was quite little, about four foot long, I think, with an angry little face wizened arms and the tail of a fish. It was all dried up, like a mummy. Charlie thanked him for the creature, which he called a mermaid, and gave it to the blonde barmaid, who shuddered slightly before placing it on the shelf behind the bar. I watched as the sailor started chatting to her and she poured him a drink. She laughed as she passed it across the counter. I could see her asking him about his tattoos, the swallows and the dragon you could see disappearing under his shirt. 
At one point, she reached out and traced one of the birds with her finger. His eyes were fixed on her face as she did it, as though he was falling under a spell. Dad looked at the mermaid and frowned. Puts me right off my pint. Why do they give him things? I whispered. He's their banker. Even was the treasurer of the union for a while, my dad told me. Buys from them and from Delos all over the shop. It was getting late and smoke was so thick in the room that my throat was feeling sore. Someone started playing the piano and the barmaid, whose name I had learned was Lily, came out from behind the bar and started to sing, her voice astonishing and pure, an effortless soprano. Her blonde hair, which she wore unfashionably long, had a natural curl, and her skin was so pale and smooth that it made you want to stroke it. She caught my eye and winked as she sang about losing her way and not knowing where to roam. I thought she was more beautiful than a movie star, a grown-up woman, although she might only have been a few years older than me, I suppose. I must have watched her with a puppy dog expression on my face because Dad clipped me on the ear. Next to Lily, Sally the Malt, the other barmaid, began dancing. She was also beautiful, but her dark eyes were hard as stone and she hardly ever spoke. She could dance though, my God, that girl could move. The bartender, George, was pouring drinks as fast as he could, sweating as it was close to closing time. The shaven-headed sailor was standing by the piano, drinking whiskey. They would all carry on until closing. When George would raise a finger, the dancing would stop and the piano would immediately fall silent as the punters filed out. Someone tapped me on my shoulder as I watched Lily and Sal and I realised it was Charlie. I jumped to my feet. Can I borrow your boy for a moment? he asked. Dad nodded and I followed Charlie up the stairs, full of excitement. I knew that Charlie kept all his real valuables, his Ming vases and ivory sculptures, in the ebony cabinet up there, along with the visitor's book, which had been signed by the King of Spain and many others. I'd heard of all these things, but never seen them. Thanks, he said to me. Wait a second, would you? His son, Charlie Jr., was waiting for him in an armchair next to the fireplace. I stared at Charlie's ebony cabinet. It was black and shiny, oriental in design. There was an ivory figurine standing on it. It must have been only two feet high, but it drew my eye away from everything else in this cluttered room which was full of treasures. She wore a headdress with a flat top and beads hanging from it, and long robes with beaded necklaces, each fold of material looking like the real thing, as though if she moved it would move with her. Her little hands were in front of her, carrying a staff. Her eyes were looking down as though she was shy. Isn't she lovely? said a voice in my ear and I jumped. Charlie had come up silently behind me. She's the pride of my collection. Bought her from a dealer in Shanghai, 800 years old, and her name is Mazu, the goddess of the sea. She was known as the silent girl and she protects all sailors and fishermen. Protection. That's what it's all about, isn't it? He looked at Charlie Jr. There's the good kind and there's the other kind, said Charlie Jr., staring morosely into the fire. But I got no choice. Here you go, lad, he said, handing me an envelope. Take this. Go to Wapping tonight, after closing, and don't stop till you put it in the hands of the person named on the package and, he put his finger next to his nose, not a word. There's half a crown in it for you. I tucked the package inside my jacket and headed downstairs. At the bottom of the stairs, I bumped into Lily, who was on her way back behind the bar to help George before last orders. Hi, handsome, she said, ruffling my hair, and I blushed. Been looking at Charlie's collection, have you? He likes his pretty things, does Charlie. And he takes good care of them, not like most men. Sal overheard the last comment and snorted. Unexpectedly, she spoke. I don't expect no man to take care of me. That's why I've got a shiv in me boot. They both laughed. I felt like they were laughing at me and I began blushing again and went off to find my dad. After closing time, I went on to whopping, as I'd been asked. I didn't look at the package closely, but from the feel of it, it held a bundle of notes. The fog had got thick enough, it was hard to see more than twenty feet ahead. The warehouses and dock buildings loomed above me in the night, like cliffs. 
In the darkness, my hearing sharpened and I began to notice the slap of the water and occasional footsteps from other people finding their way through the fog. I was walking past the dock when I saw a couple silhouetted against the light of the gas lamp standing by the railings. Her bright hair, visible even through the gloom, and his height revealed them as Lily and the sailor from the other night. Locked in an embrace, I thought at first. Then I realised there was something violent, a struggle between them. In a sudden movement, Lily went over the railings into the icy black water and the sailor dived in after her. I ran to the edge and looked over. The hazy light from the lamp illuminated them both as they thrashed in the water and as I watched, I thought I saw something writhing in the dark beneath Lily. Like some gigantic sea creature. The sailor's hands flew up in a frantic gesture and his head sank below the surface. I was about to run for help when I realised Lily was now swimming effortlessly and strongly back to the shore. With an easy, graceful movement, she pulled herself out of the water back onto the dock and sat there resting for a moment. I realised that she was naked. Apart from the scales that glinted around her waist and onwards, down, down, down to the end of her muscular tail, I couldn't look away until she looked up to where I stood, trembling, and I saw her sharp teeth and the blood on them. I ran away from the alley as fast as I could in the fog, until I got to Wapping Prison, where I muttered something about a message from Charlie Brown and handed over my package to the governor there. Mum didn't say anything about me being out so late. She'd saved me a bit of bread and dripping, which was usually my favourite, but I couldn't face it. So I said goodnight to her and crept into the bed I shared with my little brothers. Dad came in later, drunk as a lord, singing at the top of his voice, and I could hear them shouting at each other as I tried to sleep. It didn't upset me as much as usual, though, because all I could think about were the sailor's hands held up in surrender as he sank below the filthy waters of the river, and Lily's face, streaked with blood, bright with triumph. I saw him often in my dreams and always checked the papers when dead bodies were found in the Thames. But a tall man with two swallows on his arms and a dragon tattoo was never mentioned. Manzu's protection hadn't extended to him, it seems. But that's the thing about sailors. It's easy for them to disappear. I was at Charlie's funeral procession, along with crowds of people lining the road all the way to Bow Cemetery. There were thousands of people there, the papers said it was a fitting farewell to the King of Limehouse. Old Charlie's coffin was in a black hearse with three carriages behind, filled with flowers. Ten black Flanders horses with feathered plumes on their harnesses, high-stepping and beautiful. Behind the carriage, as well as cars following the funeral procession, walked sailors, stevedores, Chinese men in tall hats, lascars, publicans, shopkeepers, even the mayor of Poplar in all his gold chains all the way from the railway tavern where the canary's cage was covered with a black cloth, past the place where Charlie had boxed as a lightweight and his first pub in Whitechapel Road to Bow Cemetery where he was finally laid to rest below a grand family tomb made of pink marble with an angel standing on top. It seemed to me like everything was changing. I came home from school a few days later to find my dad home early, even though it was laundry day, Sitting in the kitchen while my mum ran about with wet sheets, his leg in a plaster cast. I've had to sling my hooks, son, he said. Broke my fucking leg when one of the boxes fell on me. You're going to have to help us out. So it was off to the docks for me. The union paid out a bit to cover my dad being out of work, but it wasn't enough. That was the end of my dreams of going to sea, until war broke out five years later and I joined the Navy. I plucked up the courage to go back to Charlie's, finally, when I was on leave in London. The servicemen still loved it, sailors and soldiers all drinking there. Charlie Jr. had moved on and the crowd was even wilder than it used to be. Men dressed like women, brasses, the lot. It wasn't quite the same though. It was like something had gone out of the old place after Lily left, which George told me, as I drank my pint, had happened the day I'd seen her by the river. 
never saw or heard from her again after that night. The first tattoo I got done was to remind me of her. Are you sure? asked the tattooist. It'll cost you a few bob and it's going to hurt too. I'm sure, I told him. Sirens lure sailors to death with their singing. Like the sea, they're beautiful but dangerous too. I asked him to draw her sitting on a rock, her blonde hair curling in the wind. When he finished, she told me it was the best inking he'd ever done. It felt like something was guiding my hand, he said. Once I saw Sally the Malt again. I was down Brick Lane while the market was on, near the shoe shop. The stalls there sell junk and antiques all crammed in together a bit like Charlie Brown's in a way. Anyway, one of the stall holders was playing a piano in the street, a tune I recognised, and this old girl was dancing. I recognised her right away. The dark eyes like stone, wrinkles like they were carved on her face, but she was still beautiful, like a drunk duchess. All the stall holders were shouting, Go on, Sal, and clapping her. She might have been a down and out, for all I knew. The ones you see scavenging for fruit and veg around the market were asleep in front of the crypt at Christchurch but she could still dance like she meant it. Jacqueline Crane, and this one is called um, Into Focus. He's long ago lost his own East End accent, and those around him seem harsh and strange, as foreign as those of the sailors at the next table. It's been a long day, and he has settled gratefully into the snug at Charlie Brown's. Now he gazes up, at the shelves stacked with miniatures and painted vases, walls hung with portraits, posters, plates. His eyes catch on a photograph. Without quite thinking about it, he's already on his feet, and then he's there. It is that street, the very street he remembers. Horses, dogs, children, captured on one sunny day. Awnings are caught as they flap in the wind, cabriolets as the wheels turn, here, always frozen, still. And there, just on the most familiar corner, is the figure of a man with a little girl. Next to them, a woman holds a baby. Her dress is grey, but he remembers it, blue as the sky. He peers closer to see their tiny faces, feeling his memories resolve into clarity. He takes a breath, then returns to his beer. Alan Y. Dutch Courage Ding ding, the bell rang out over the rowdy crowd that called the end of the penultimate round. Charlie trudged back to his corner and slumped on his stool, deflated. The voice of his coach, Mickey, echoed incoherently like waves underwater to Charlie's throbbing ears. He knew though that Mickey would have included some unsavory words berating his assistant for forgetting the water for his fighter. From what vision remained of his eyes swollen to the size of golf balls, Charlie saw Mickey pluck a mug from one ecstatic spectator. Mickey offered the mug to Charlie's lips. The crisp, frothy bubbles perked him up and he found himself wanting every last drip of the refreshing golden liquid. No spit bucket required. The bells sounded for the final round of the belt. With newfound adrenaline, Charlie stepped up to the impossible task in front of him. In the end, he was not victorious, but the alcohol had dulled his senses enough for him to see out the bout still standing. However, with the taste of the brew on that crucial moment, Charlie had found his calling. Not to continue his boxing career or to turn to alcoholism, but he decided he was to serve up the beverage that saved him that fateful night. So it was the birth of Charlie Brown's The Railway Tarpon. Um, my name's Deborah Lloyd Bangay. The title is called George. Standing alone on the platform, smoke bellowing from an oncoming train, anxiety and dread of what will be at the end of the journey. 
suitcase in hand, packed with unkempt clothing. Hungry and sad, a tear falls upon an already grubby shirt. Worn shoes step onto the carriage and hesitantly steps towards an empty seat. Still holding onto the suitcase for comfort, the smog and grime of London gradually become clearer and greener. Fear falls through a tiny body as open land becomes a threat. Panic and numbness rack upon a frozen brain, screaming to return to the safety of death and disease that is home. Stepping down from the carriage, emotionally broken, Aunt Ethel's hands become an internal saviour. He stepped onto barren pathways, hearing imaginary groans of forlorn, lost souls. Strangers mixed together like an East End broth, becoming one entity of blood and empty skulls. Forging false friendship, friendships in overcrowded beds beneath the earth, flowing together in, in eternal death. George reminisced as he walked slowly back to the train station, whispering goodbye. Mahogany Blue. Little George, who ran away, the boy who survived, the only one alive. They forever rest in their purple's grave. The family wood, who died of Spanish flu, turned mahogany blue. Together no more. Around the table, sharing the humble loaf, felt like a feast when Bovera was tea. Mother coughing through the tears, kissing the last good night to little Katie. Today, hope has died, buried with my own, my blood, my dearest, together no more. Thank you very much. Could you just say your name? Silvia. Silvia Di Fino. <laughs> Uh, it's Jacqueline Crane, um, and this is called Pussycat. I pull him inside the house, his other hand tangled in my hair, which has tumbled loose sometime this evening. Silently, I touch the taper to one lamp, then turn back to his smile. We're making for the armchair when he stops. His eyes are dull, his mouth a tight line. I follow his gaze. But all that's there is Tabby, curled on the chair, her paws twitching in sleep. He's as still as the air on a hot day, and his hand is tight in mine. She's not fierce, I say. He moves again, just a little, leaning back towards the door. His body trembles. Besides, she's asleep, I continue, and he steadies. He reaches out one hand. Hello, oh, my name is uh, Michael Bundy. My first story is called A Difficult Case. So, Dr. O'Connor, in your own words, please tell the court your relationship with Sister Ballard. Relationship, sir? I don't understand what you mean. By relationship, I intend your professional interaction or intercourse with Sister Ballard. Ah, yes, intercourse, I see. Uh, our profession, sir, allows for only the briefest of encounters, always with the welfare of the inmates at heart, always compassionate, caring, and Christian. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. But what of the personal character of Sister Ballard? I have always found her reliable, trustworthy, and compliant. Compliant, Doctor? In what way, compliant? I mean um, simply um, that she was always ready to perform her sisterly duties. You understand, Dr. O'Connor, that Sister Ballard has been accused of receiving gentlemen callers late at night. Yes, but I have no knowledge of this. No knowledge, Doctor. And do you have any knowledge of a missing vial of strychnine? Doctor? You have gone very pale. Do you need a moment to recover? No, sir. 
Well then, Doctor, what is your answer to my question? I refuse to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Okay, this is a, a music hall duet. Get a move on, Alec, you lummock. We're going to be late. Don't tell me what to do, woman. I'm your husband now, not just one of your stage door johnnies. Well, shift it, mate. We have to be at Wilton's in 15 minutes. And don't dilly-dally on the way, is that it? Just because it's you who's got top billing doesn't mean you can't feel the back of my hand. Don't threaten me, Alex Hurley. Don't forget that all you've got, your fancy whisky and your gold watch chain, you owe it all to me. And what would you be without your fine feathers and silk dresses? Just another tart who works out of the ten bells. Just another ruin what Cromwell knocked about a bit. Well, it's me who's got her name in the limelight, Alex Hurley, ex-boxer and indifferent tenor. It's me what will be remembered. You'll be lucky to end up in a pauper's grave in Tower Hamlet Cemetery. <laughs> 